is the Deputy for Maritime Affairs and Natural Resources of the Ministry of National Development Planning or BAPENAS. And afterwards, uh, Ms. Krista Rader, World Food Program representative for Indonesia will deliver the first 10 minute keynote speech followed by Mr. Maximo Torero, who is the chief economist of the Food and Agriculture Organizations, FAO, in Rome, Italy. The panel presentations will be started with Mr. Jamie Morrison, the FAO Food System and Food Safety Division Director, also in Rome, Italy. And it followed by Ms. Lise Albrechtsen, the Norway's government special representative on climate adaptation and food security. Ms. Carola Ramon, who currently served as the Undersecretary for Multilateral and Bilateral Economic Negotiations of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Argentina, will become the third speaker. Then, Pak Drajat Martianto, the team leader of the Food System Analysis Collaborative Study between BAPNAS, FAO, and IPB University CFS Center, will become the fourth speaker. Later on, Mr. Ivan Cosio Cortes, as the country director for Southeast Asia and Pacific Sub Regional Office of the International Fund for Agricultural Development, or IFAD, will deliver the closing remarks. Throughout the, the discussions, I will be joined by Pa Anang Nugroho. He is the Food and Agriculture Director from BAPNAS, and today he will become the moderator. And Pak Richard Frenchard, uh, the FAO Ad Interim Representative for Indonesia and Timor Leste, will be part of the panel discussions. We will also have a 20-minute Q&A session, so feel free to ask any questions you may have throughout the webinar by using the Q&A box. And the panelists are also welcome to immediately respond to the questions through the Q&A box. And also, please do not hesitate to ask the questions in Bahasa Indonesia because we will help you to translate it in English. As today's webinar will be conducted in English, fear not, you still can access the simultaneous interpretations provided by our team. We will have our colleague Hikmat Gumilar and Dio Suhendra as our interpreters today. You can access the Indonesian translations through the Japanese channel on your Zoom interface. Webinar kali ini akan berlangsung dalam bahasa Inggris, jadi bagi Anda yang membutuhkan fitur terjemahan ke dalam bahasa Indonesia, Anda bisa mengakses channel bahasa Jepang dalam aplikasi Zoom Anda. Rekan kami Hikmat Gumilar dan Dio Suhenda akan ada di sana untuk menerjemahkan, jangan khawatir bukan ke dalam bahasa Jepang, tapi ke dalam bahasa Indonesia. So for those who are interested in food system issues, we encourage you to join more webinars on food system that will be conducted by BAPNAS. So please look forward to it. Once again, thank you for particip participating in our webinar and you can always support good journalism by subscribing today to the jakartapost.com slash packages with only 600,000 rupiah per year. I will share the link in the chat box as well. Without further ado, I will welcome Pak Arifin Rudianto to state your opening remark. And Pak Arifin, the platform is yours now, Pak. Thank you, Ibu Dri. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Honorable UN Resident Coordinator Indonesia. Honorable FAO Indonesia Representative. Honorable WFP Indonesia Country Director. Honorable IFAD Indonesia Country Director. Honorable Norway Government Special Representative on Climate Adaptation and Food Security, Honorable Argentina's Foreign Ministry Under Secretary for Multilateral and Bilateral Economic Negotiation, Honorable Ambassador of the Government of Norway for Indonesia, Honorable Ambassador of the Government of Argentine for Indonesia. Honorable Dr. Drajat Martianto from IPB University, Honorable Representative from Ministries, Development Partners, Community Organization, Academic and Universities, and Business Sector. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon from Jakarta, Indonesia. First of all, let us praise and thank the Almighty God for providing us had an opportunity 
to be able to attend this webinar on transforming food system for affordable healthy diets, global and national strategy. We appreciate FAO, WFP, IFAD, and Jakarta Post to facilitate us representing different stakeholders in discussing this important topic. This food system transformation will focus on global and national strategies transformation process. Furthermore, sharing lesson learned from other countries is as well important. To learn from each other on how the food system transformation should be implemented. It is also a series of important activities for us, especially the government of Indonesia, to prepare our participation and contribution to the UN Food System Summit on 2021. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, before COVID-19 pandemic, based on several international and national indexes, our food security situation had improved. However, despite those improvement trends, we also have deeply noted some considerable challenges and issues, including stunting, wasting, quality food consumption, food safety, and sustainability of natural resources. Our concern on the issue of stunting and wasting is not only on its percentage, but also its pace of reduction that need to be significantly accelerated. Furthermore, as one of the important indicators of um, midterm development planning 2020-2024, we have put also our attention on how to improve the desirable dietary pattern score. During the pandemic, our economic growth is contracted by 3.49% in the third quarter of 2020. On the other hand, the agricultural sector is still able to grow positively by 2.15%. In addition, the farmer's term of trade has experienced an increasing trend since July 2020. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected most of the basic aspect of our society in terms of poverty, unemployment, and so on. Concern about the rising of food crisis, the increasing hunger and malnutrition, as well as the increasing obstacle of promoting sustainable agriculture must be put in a very high attention. Risk assessment and mitigation action must be well prepared, calling for the transformation of our food system to be more inclusive, reliable and sustainable. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, food system has been one of the national priorities in our national development planning, as stipulated in the presidential decree number 18, year 2020, on the midterm development planning 2020-2024. One of the national program priorities is the increasing availability accessibility and quality of food, within which one of priority activities is the improving national food system governance. A sustainable food system needs to be approached with a holistic and systematic way. Consequently, it requires collaboration among all relevant stakeholders to carry out consensus and collective action. An affordable healthy diet of food system should be based on the diversification of agricultural commodities in which an inclusive value chain must be built to deliver them to the consumer in the affordable price and efficient way. The development of the food system is directed towards the transformation of planning and budgeting as well with a demand-driven approach. Food planning is to achieve the ideal score of a uh, ideal score for the food. Then this target is detailed, distributed, and derived through along agri-food value chain. Food consumption, 
food demand, food logistic, food supply, and food production. The transformation of food system must also concern on the principle of no one left behind. Constructive and positive participation and contribution from different stakeholders will be very useful to strengthen our food system in a systematic way. Such a stakeholder platform is also one of our important consensus to facilitate communication, coordination, and synergy among us. Ladies and gentlemen, this webinar is one of our important efforts in carrying out the mandate of the law and regulation to build a holistic and systematic food system. I believe that your participation and insight in insight will be your significant contribution to strengthen our food system. Transforming food system need collaboration among stakeholders, the government, private sector, farmer group, trader, and consumer, at all level, local, national, regional, and global level. As above mentioned, we may well note that next year, the UN Secretary General will hold the UN Food System Summit. This webinar will be considered as kick-off event prior to the national and sub-national dialogue for the preparation on the upcoming UN Food System Summit 2021 to build a consensus and collective action that synergize all programs from the key stakeholders to achieve a massive collective movement to have fundamental change and transformation for the resilient and sustainable food system in Indonesia, and also to achieve nutritious, balanced, safe, and diverse food for human resource development in Indonesia. This webinar is our initial step for food system transformation in Indonesia to achieve a healthy diet and food security not only at the national level, but also at the family level. A sustainable food system strategy should promote collaboration between government, private sector, farmer group, traders, and consumers in providing and diversifying food production, supply, and consumption. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the opening remarks, Pa Arifin. Uh, due to time constraint, I will directly invite Ms. Krista Rader to deliver her 10-minute keynote speech. So, Ms. Krista, uh, the time is yours now. Thank you. And uh, Salamat Siang, a very good afternoon. Honorable Deputy Minister for Maritime Affairs and Natural Resources of the Ministry of National Development Planning, Bapenas Pak Arifin Rudianto. Honorable Director for Food and Agriculture in Bapenas, Pak Anang Nugroho, the moderator of today's session and discussions. In the order of speakers, Dr. Maximo Torero, FAO Chief Economist. Dr. Jamie Morrison, FAO Food Systems and Food Safety Division Director. Dr. Lise Albrechtsen, the Government of Norway's Special Representative on Climate Adaptation and Food Security. Dr. Carola Ramon, the government of Argentina's Ministry of Foreign Affairs under Secretary for Bilateral and Multilateral Economic Negotiations. Dr. Drajat Martianto, CAFAS Center, IPB Agricultural University in Bogor. Fellow representatives, Richard Trenchard of FAO and Ivan Cosio of IFAD. Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this international seminar on transforming food systems for affordable healthy diets. I welcome you on behalf of the Rome-based agencies 
of the United Nations, the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, and the World Food Program, WFP, which have jointly committed here in Indonesia to support the government and the people to work towards sustainable food systems for affordable, healthy diets. This seminar will focus on the following objectives. First, to discuss strategies on food systems transformation for affordable, healthy diets by shifting from a sectoral approach to a holistic food systems approach. Second, to discuss the methodological framework in support of such food systems transformation. Third, to share experiences on food systems transformation from Norway, Argentina, and Indonesia, or G20 countries to discuss possible policy options and investments that will foster food systems transformation for making healthy diets affordable and accessible for all. Food systems cover the whole range from food production to processing, transport, wholesale, retail, to demand by households up to consumption by individuals. The whole system faces challenges worldwide. But let me refer to Indonesia. Food consumed here is largely produced in Indonesia and also imported. As far as local production is concerned, more than 90% of producers are smallholder farmers who mainly are engaged in the production of rice, which is the dominant source of calories of a population of 267 million. Rice cultivation productivity is relatively low. Production of vegetables and fruits in many countries, the focus of women cultivators is limited. Supply chains are challenging, given the geography of the archipelago. There have been import levies to protect domestic production. All this makes available food relatively expensive. On the consumption side, we have one third of the population that cannot afford a healthy diet as per our 2017 cost of the diet analysis. I repeat, one third, that's a lot. There is also widespread snacking of cheap processed food, high in carbohydrates, salt and trans fats, clearly unhealthy diets. 95% of the population do not consume enough vegetables and fruits, 95%, a striking figure. There are high rates of stunting as the deputy minister already mentioned, but not only stunting and wasting, also high rates of overnutrition and micronutrient deficiencies. And related to this, a rising trend of non-communicable diseases later in life. Hypertension, type two, diabetes, cancer, etc. All comorbidities in the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. About 30% of the children below five are stunted. One third of adults suffer from overnutrition or obesity. Half of pregnant women are anemic. 
While food is not the only factor, it plays a major role. Healthy food needs to become more affordable, also for the poor. This requires that food systems be transformed. Agricultural production and supply chains need to become more diverse, as the Deputy Minister pointed out. And this is especially in terms of providing more vegetables and fruits. And they have to become more efficient to keep prices low. Women cultivators need to be proactively supported to achieve their full potential. The private sector needs to play its part to reduce the rate of unhealthy ingredients in processed food and beverages they offer. The consumers need to purchase and consume a more diverse and healthy diet. They may have the income to purchase food for a healthier diet and or social protection cash transfers may be increased to allow for a healthy diet as done here in Indonesia based on the cost of diet analysis. But this does not necessarily lead to the consumption of healthy diets. There are human beings involved Behavior change is not an easy process, we all know. And without behavior change, the demand for healthy food may not increase substantially. Policy and administrative systems are not, not yet, designed along the lines of food systems. They are sectoral by agriculture, trade, health and nutrition, etc. In order to work towards affordable, healthy diets, cross government efforts are required to bring production, processing, distribution and consumption together under a food systems approach. And, in a, and of course, in a country as diverse as Indonesia, there will be many or are many food systems to be taken into consideration, especially as the government so laudably aims at achieving sustainable food systems that help conserve the environment and mitigate the impacts of climate change. The Rome-based agencies in Indonesia highly welcome that Bappenas brings its convening strengths to address this challenge of food systems transformation. And we are delighted that it leads the event today in the run-up to the Food Systems Summit Dialogues, which will soon start in preparation of the Food Systems Summit later this year. We are excited to have FAO's Director of Food Systems and Food Safety, Jamie Morrison, with us to share insights into the Food Systems Summit related processes. To have FAO's Chief Economist, Maximo Torero, introducing to us some of the food systems approaches and analytics that are being developed and to hear from several G20 governments, Argentina, Norway, and Indonesia, about their experiences in dealing with food systems transformations. We look forward to an inspiring sharing of knowledge and a stimulating discussion. Thank you. Thank you for the insightful speech, uh, Ms. Krista. Uh, for the next, I will invite uh, the second keynote speaker, Mr. Maximo Torero. So, sir, the time is yours now. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this kind invitation, and, and thank you, uh, Excellencies, uh, and especially Papanas, for organizing this extremely important meeting. Let me share my, my screen uh, with my, my presentation. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is about uh, food systems transformation and, and what is the motivation and the science behind of what we are doing and how we are trying to pursue this and how we hope uh, we can work together with the governments. The key me I have three key messages today. The first is food system transformation is necessary, but it's not easy, it's complex. Uh, second, we need models and understanding of how to use them to handle the situation that we are facing. And third, we need to bring science into the governance process uh, to be able to develop appropriate uh, food system transformation, which we are looking. So let me start with the first uh, key message. W why we need to focus in the agri-food systems? And we call it agri-food systems because it's broader than just food. Food is, is, is built and processed in the peri-urban urban areas, but the production, the agricultural part is also extremely important. That's why also we, we think it's important to bring the agricultural component to the food system component and not just focus on the food part. Uh, now, first of all, as we all know, the world is not on track uh, of the six of, of achieving the SDG2. Uh, before even COVID-19, we had 690 million people uh, suffer from chronic hunger um, and nearly 60 million uh, grow in, in five years. 144 million people, 21% of children under five years of age are stunted. 47 million are wasted and 38% are overweight. And more than 2 billion people suffer from overweight and obesity. So those challenges are putting us off track and off path of achieving SE2. And all these elements have been extremely exacerbated by COVID-19. The number of undernourishment is projected to increase between 115 million people more undernourished which we will put us in 2030 by 900 or more million people under nourish, completely off track of the zero hunger uh, SEG2. At the same time, rural poverty is projected to increase substantially, and basically we're going to lose one decade of reduction of, 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 of extreme poverty. But not only that, when we did the analysis of uh, healthy diets and cost of access to healthy diets, we found that 3 billion people cannot afford uh, a healthy diet. So a healthy diet is five times more expensive than an energy caloric sufficient diet and 60% more expensive than a nutrient sufficient diet. So that means that something is not working well. We are not providing what is needed to be able to achieve not only reduction of undernourishment, but at the same time to be able to achieve the reduction of overweight and obesity, which is required to reduce the non-communicable diseases, which is a medium and long-term problem for our governments. So this requires a change. This requires a significant transformation because making diets more affordable is not a simple issue. You don't want to affect producers. You want producers also to get returns of what they do. But at the same time, you need to benefit consumers so that they can have and be able to access. So it combines not only increasing efficiency in production and for example, reduction of food loss and waste, but also it combines with an increase of income so that people can have better access to this type of diet. So it's both elements. We cannot look only at the supply side, we have to look at the supply and demand side. And that's part of the system approach. The system approach is to move away from silos and is to try to combine all the elements that could be affected. And of course, the uh, natural resources. Now, humanity is waging a war on nature, as the Secretary General uh, Antonio Gutierrez said in the State of the World at Columbia University in 2020. Why? Because our biodiversity is collapsing. One million species are at risk of extinction. The ecosystems are disappearing before our eyes. Deserts are spreading. Wetlands are being lost. Every year we lose 10 million hectares of forest. In 2019, carbon dioxide levels reached 148% of pre-industrial uh, levels. Today, we are at 1.2 degrees Celsius of warming and already witnesses unprecedented climate extremes and volatility in every region and in, in every continent. And we are headed for a thundering temperature rise of three to five degrees centers, centi Celsius if this, in this century, if this continues as we are going. So food systems are, are one of the main reasons we are failing to stay within our planet's ecological boundaries. And that's what we need to look and think carefully. So the challenge is complex. We have to produce more. We have to produce cheaper. We have to increase income, but we have a huge restriction of our ecological boundaries. 
we cannot keep operating the way we are doing. So that means increasing efficiency and changing the way in which we produce to be able to achieve this goal. And that's where we believe we can uh, work on this transformation together with Indonesia so that we can achieve this important, important change. They are by far uh, the, the largest economic systems, the agri-food systems, uh, measure in terms of employment and livelihoods uh, and, and planetary impact. So worldwide, there is 1.2 billion people which are employed through agricultural food systems, production, harvesting, services, processing, and distribution. So when you look at the whole value chain and the whole elements of the value chain, that's the amount of people being employed by the agricultural sector and by the agricultural value chain system. And there is 3.5 billion people or livelihoods which are also touched as a result of what we do in this agriculture. And not only that, poverty and inequality are endemic to the systems and they are endemic to the rural areas. 80% of extreme poor live in rural areas. And of these, 75% earn some part of their living through agri-food systems. So there is no way we will be able to achieve SDG 1, move out of extreme poverty, and SDG 2, if we don't combine them together and we don't look at the rural transformation. And the rural transformation is a continuing process. It's a continuous process that moves from extremely rural areas to periurban areas, what we call the catchment areas, and then to big cities. But just between the rural and the periurban, the catchment cities where people start to move, to move towards cities when they do migration out of rural areas, there's a significant potential to transform our food system by increasing extending value chains. Because, for example, the catchment areas should have access to electricity, should have access to infrastructure, which will allow them to do the processing of what we produce in the rural areas. So again, there's significant potential to create a difference and a change. This is just to show how we decompose the jobs, 1.28 billion jobs in agriculture and 3.2 billion jobs in service, in, in livelihoods being affected by agriculture. The pie chart uh, uh, next to the table is showing the distribution across the different sectors. Um, for example, we see that food processing, food services and distribution services have a 60% share of the sector which tells us again that it's not only the production area, but it's also how important the services are. Now, what we know today is that around 35% of these jobs are being at risk because of COVID-19. And if we look at the distribution and we look at the gender composition of these three areas of 60% is mostly females. So again, this COVID-19 is not only affecting labor, but it's also affecting even more, more females, which is increasing even more the inequalities and the differences that we need to minimize uh, in this sector. Now, we need to transform our world uh, and the main title and core aspiration of the 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development and the SDGs is how we can achieve them in the, in the years that we have left. We need to change at planetary scale and we need to define a collective pathway for transition in sustainable development. And, this, and there is a concept that normally we, we don't take into account. The environmental issues, for example, emissions produced by the agricultural sector are not just affecting one country, it's affecting the world. So it's a global public good that is being affected by this externality. And there are goods, public goods at the level of the country that also could be affected, water, soils, etc. But if we have this concept of what is global and a public good and what is a private public good, then we can understand the dynamics and the incentives that we need to put in place. Access to healthy diets, is a private individual good so that individuals can have access to his, these healthy diets. But if I am going to achieve the access to healthy diets, and to do that, I will create more emissions in the world, then I will be affecting a global public good. And that's where I need to balance all the countries and all the regions of the world. It's not just an issue of one country, it's an issue that affects the whole global public good. So we need to be very careful to differentiate these issues to be able to understand what is going on. Now, what is transformative change? So transformative change differs from evolutionary or chaotic change in that it is intentional change based on societal agreements and factor understandings and achieves outcomes at this scale. The relevant, the relevant societal agreement in 2030 agenda is, of course, the achievement of the SDGs, including the Paris Agreement and the Addis Ababa Action Agreement. Factor understanding is knowledge that meets the test of science, and what is missing is the pathway to knowledge that supports effective action. And here is where we think that we need models and understanding of how to use them to handle this situation. One of the biggest efforts we are doing uh, as part of the summit is to try to bring this modeling framework 
that will allow us to understand for every policy that we can implement, what we call the game changer policies to create this agri-food system transformation, what are the consequences? What are the impacts? What are the trade-offs? What are the synergies? So having this structure of modeling will allow us to look at this transformation of this agri-food system. Why? Because we need to scale up climate resilience across our food system. We need to intervene along the food supply chain to lower the cost of nutritious foods, as we explained before. We need to integrate humanitarian development based building policies in conflict areas because conflict we know increases undernourishment and we need to control for that. We need to find solutions. We need to pursue the dietary partner, partner patterns with low impact on health and environment. We need to strengthen economic resilience of the most vulnerable and also increase economic resilience of production. And we need to tackle structural inequalities, ensuring interventions are proper and inclusive. And normally we focus too much or we focus enough on, on poverty and extreme poverty and nourishment, but we also need to focus on in inequalities. Because if we don't reduce inequalities in parallel to reducing extreme poverty and nourishment, we are not going to be sustainable. We will go back into extreme poverty, we will go back into undernourishment. The only way this will be sustainable over time is by reducing inequalities. The important thing is how all these elements fit together and how we can bring them together so that we can do proper assessments. Now, the idea is that we want to understand and to measure what we call the trade-offs. And the trade-offs among the SDGs have not normally been touched. And whatever policy we implement to achieve SDG 1 or SDG 2 or SDG 3 or 4, it will create some trade-offs. And it could also create positive synergies if we do them together. That's why we want to make it important and we want to bring it up into the discussions. So whatever path the country decides to move, it's important that they understand what are the trade-offs and the synergies of their actions, of their policies, so that they can minimize those trade-offs or they can take a different path which could be more efficient to achieve that. Yeah. What we know today, for example, is that moving into healthy diets will improve the reduction of NCDs, but will also improve, depending on the type of diet, the effects over the environment. So we now know that. How we can accelerate that process and how we can do the transformation that we need to achieve that. And for that, we need to better understand the trade-offs, especially between SDG 1 and SDG 2, which is important. Now, our vision uh, on this and, and where we want to, to complement our efforts with, with the government of Indonesia is to, we need accelerators because the change needs to move very fast. And we have designed four accelerators in FAO. First is data, but especially real-time data, new data, and Indonesia has been leading on, on situation rooms, for example, of early warning systems. How we can use these accelerators on data to inform better, to make better decisions. Second, we need to use technology and we need to understand technology properly. What works, what doesn't work for the country, for the realities. What is the evidence of each of the different choices of science you can do to be able to resolve the problem? And also we need to bring innovation. We need to be flexible, digital technologies, flexibility to be able to adjust to the situation. We are moving into a world of automation. We're moving into a world of integration. We're moving into a world of digital technologies with digital markets and platforms. So how we can accelerate that and build that up in the country. But to be able to do and accelerate in those three accelerators, which we can move very fast, we need to have what we call the complements. And those could slow down. That's why the, the arrow goes in a different direction a little bit the other three accelerators. But it's important to have them in place because we want to be sure that we have the governance in place, the institutions in place to avoid inequality increase, to avoid concentration of market power, to avoid problems that we normally know these technologies and innovation could create. But we also need to have the human capital. Because the last thing we want is that the automation process and the digitalization process will create more unemployment the rural sector and the agricultural sector is significantly big enough and we need to avoid that. And for that, we need to build capabilities. We need to have a labor supply that is ready to match that labor demand. So those accelerators for us are crucial and that's something that we need to look uh, very carefully. Now, uh, do you apologize, can... Mr. Uh, Maximo, you have one minute left. Sure. So how we plan to address uh, these cognitive ch challenges with models? We are developing models that will simplify the reality that will help us to assess the different scenarios and the different impacts to see what is the synergies, where are the trade-offs and what we can do and how we can accelerate the path to achieve SDG 1 and SDG 2. 
And that means bringing reason, explain, to design, to communicate, to act, to predict, and to explore options. We can do this. We have the framework in place. We have the infrastructure in place. And we need to build up so that you can make the best possible decisions, understanding what are the costs and the benefits of those decisions. That will allow us to bring all the five food security action tracks together and to capture those synergies and those trade-offs, which are crucial. That's the way we move out of silos and we work in a systematic approach. And that is central for us. And that's why these models, which are global, but also at the country level, could help us enormously to understand the effects at the national, subnational level, and combine that with territorial approaches so that you can move forward in a way of improving and being more effective and efficient. So let me just finish by saying of the importance of bringing these governance elements into the decision process, how models can help in to build these complements and these governments institutionality, and how we can bring together knowledge of opportunity to bring solutions uh, to the country and to move forward in this transformation which is needed and to involve all the stakeholders into it. It is essential for us to start modest, to test and to validate so that we can bring the solutions that we need to avoid a situation like we are facing today. A situation where we are in the risk of losing everything if we are not careful. We need to create a big change and we need to be very careful to increase our resilience to risk and to uncertainty where we don't know what are the consequences. So we need to be prepared for that and that's why the summit is central in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Maximo Torero. We learned a lot from your presentations, uh, but now we are going to uh, going forward to the next sessions and we will listen to the four panelist speakers to deliver their presentations. And in this particular session, Pa Anang from Bapenas uh, will lead the discussion. So I'll hand it over to you, Pa Anang. The platform is yours now, Pa Anang. All right, thank you very much indeed, uh, Three, for uh, bringing to facilitate this introduction session. And uh, <clears throat> good afternoon and good morning as well to all of the participants. Uh, I'm trying to facilitate to get the points of consensus that we are hoping could come out from uh, the session, hopefully. Uh, since uh, we do really have uh, many, uh, maybe not new terminology, but sometimes uh, for all of us is still new. But again, uh, the keywords of transforming is matter, I think, for this discussion. Transforming from this uh, old version if I'm saying on the food system at this, uh, that uh, somehow could not facilitate or cater the sustainability or the uh, more nutrition or giving a good impact for the people's health and everything going to be uh, more resilient and sustaining for the food system to facilitate or let's say projection of the 9 billion people that will be uh, giving, uh, getting a service from this uh, so-called uh, new food systems. We are part of the big change at this moment. Well, um, on this part, I'll be trying to introduce, there are four speakers uh, before me, before us. Uh, and the first speaker, uh, is um, Mr. Jamie Morrison. Uh, he is CFAO Food System and Food Safety Division Director. And uh, uh, he will be uh, informing us uh, or sharing about the uh, principal meanings of the next forthcoming Food System Summit dialogue. And uh, what is the important part or pillars that need to be getting come into our attention related with the uh, food system transformation process globally or even could be going down internationally and even further on the locally. For Mr. Jamie Morrison, time is yours, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, and, and good afternoon to everybody. 
let me just share my screen quickly um, before I start. Okay, so we've we've heard mention already a number of times of the Food System Summit, which will take place in September this year. Um, what I want to do in this brief presentation is to give a quick overview of what we hope to achieve as a result of this summit, but then to focus down on two of the main elements of the process that are moving us towards the summit. These are a series of action tracks, Maximo has already mentioned these, and the Food System Summit Dialogues, which I think will be of particular relevance um, to this audience. So firstly, what are the outcomes that are expected from the summit process? These are, are four. Um, the first is to dramatically elevate public discourse and understanding of the importance of food systems. Each of us as consumers, as actors within the food system, make decisions every day about what we consume, um, where we source our food from, how we prepare our food, what we do with the food that we don't eat. And these decisions collectively have a significant impact on a number of aspects that the Maximo has already touched on. Um, the environmental resource use, the remuneration of actors throughout the food system. And at the same time, as individuals, we don't really talk about food in that way. Yes, we talk about it from a cultural perspective, but we don't really understand the implications of the choices we're making. So one of the outcomes of this summit process, which is, as I'll explain, a very inclusive process, is to help to ensure that the broader public really understand the implications of, of the decisions that they're making, because ultimately it's only through that public engagement that we will see significant change. A second outcome that we're hoping to achieve is significant action. We don't want a summit where we have a series of, of declarations about what needs to be done. We want a summit where we already have identified actions and mechanisms for taking those actions forward once the summit has been completed. And as I'll explain, a lot of the work on the process towards the summit is focused on identifying those so-called game-changing solutions, which will need to be actioned to transform our food systems. The summit itself will, as all summits, have an outcome document, but this won't be a negotiated outcome document. It's different to other summits. This summit will result in a, in a common understanding of the direction that we need to take and a set of commitments by different partners, not just by countries, but by private sector partners, by civil society, by us as individuals as to how we're going to change moving forward towards 2030 to ensure that the SDGs truly can be achieved. And a fourth outcome will be, we'll, we'll be putting in place a robust system of follow-up, not just to monitor um, the commitments that have been made by different actors, but to put in place a system whereby if things change as we go along, like this year, last year, sorry, we had a great example of a significant change in the context, the COVID-19 pandemic, other changes will happen as we move towards 2030. We need to be able to adjust. So we need a robust system of follow-up to ensure that the actions we're putting in place remain relevant um, to the context that we're working in. Now to move us towards the, the summit, we have um, a very wide, range, wide ranging, inclusive, and quite a complex structure that has been put in place. Um, this is a, a UN summit. It falls under the UN Secretary General, and he has delegated both to the Deputy Secretary General and to a special envoy, Agnes Kalabata, the role of taking the summit process forward. Um, this is guided by an advisory committee, which includes uh, representatives of member state, of private sector, of civil society, indigenous peoples, and, and of course of um, member states, the, the own based agencies, to guide the process. And the process itself is coordinated by a secretariat of about 15 to 20 individuals drawn from different um, organizations uh, to support this process. But what I want to talk about today is the, the middle part, 
the where the main action is taking place. We have a scientific group, an independent scientific group to ensure that all of the discussions, the decisions that are made are underpinned by the best and, and most up-to-date science and understanding around these issues. Maximo has already mentioned the work around modeling, uh, which forms a component of the work of the scientific group and will inform uh, our understanding of the trade-offs which need to be made in putting in place these different actions. Um, the action tracks, I'm going to spend a bit more time on in a moment explaining what they are and what they hope to achieve. Uh, we also have a champions network, which draws in um, well-known representatives, um, celebrities, but also heads of state um, and others who can help to elevate the discussion around food systems. A series of food system dialogues. Again, I'll touch on this in a bit more detail in a moment. And a UN task force. This is to ensure that the whole of the UN system is behind um, this process. So these different elements, and I'll touch on a bit more detail on some of them in a moment, will help us move towards a pre-summit event, which will take place um, at ministerial level in Rome in the summer, probably in July, which will help us to, to consolidate the, the different elements of the process. And then a couple of months later in September, the summit event itself, which will be at, at head of state um, level. So to, to move the process forward, we, we need to focus on what we're actually trying to achieve at the end of the day. What are the objectives of food system transformation? Um, we've identified five of these, ensuring access to safe and nutritious food for all, shifting to sustainable consumption patterns, this again, very much aimed at the actions of, of consumers or influencing the action of consumers um, to make choices which take account of the, the implications of the choices that they're making. A third objective on boosting nature positive production at scale. A fourth on advancing equitable livelihoods and value distribution, recognizing the significant number of individuals who are involved throughout the food system in terms of generating their, their, their own livelihoods. And also important, building resilience to vulnerabilities, shocks and stress. Um, not just climatic, but also market stresses. And of course, the vulnerabilities that we see in the face of disruptions caused by pandemics such as COVID-19. To operationalize these, these five um, objectives, we have five action tracks, which exactly replicate um, the five objectives. And the task of these action tracks is to identify and then to work to operationalize game-changing solutions to help us to meet those objectives. And what we mean by game-changing solution is essentially an action which is feasible. It's not just a dream, but it's something which can be put in, in place. Um, it can be based on existing um, evidence or best practices, or it can be, be based on conceptual frameworks about how we can, can um, move forward. Um, but essentially what it needs to do is to shift the way in which we operate uh, within the existing set of rules and or to change the rules within which we operate. So an example of the latter may be to repurpose agricultural subsidies um, to shift incentives away from the production of staples, for example, to the towards the production of um, more nutritious uh, products. Now, we're going through a very inclusive process, which I'll touch on in a moment, to, to identify what these um, game-changing solutions may be, but essentially they have to meet three key criteria. There has to be impact at scale. We have to see a, a a return on investment. They have to be actionable. There's no good just um, coming up with ideas, but we need ideas which are politically feasible, where we have the capacity and where the costs do not exceed the benefits of putting them in place. And they have to be sustainable. We always have to keep the 2030 agenda in mind. Um, in terms of identifying these solutions, there are many sources. Uh, we have frequent public um, 
generally virtual consultations. There's an online form which anyone can use to submit their own ideas about game-changing solutions, maybe building upon what they're doing in their own communities already. Um, there's the leadership team that's been established around each action track, uh, which is drawn from experts in different fields generating these ideas. Of course, we have a lot of existing reports and, and the work of different think tanks. This work is being drawn on. And finally, we will be working closely with countries and communities through Food System Summit Dialogues to generate ideas which are truly game-changing within those contexts. So let me just turn to finish to the Food System Summit Dialogues, because this is where action will happen during the process towards the summit at the country level in particular. There are three different types of dialogue. Firstly, member state dialogues, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little more detail. Secondly, global dialogues. These are held at major global events. Um, for example, we have the, the COP on biodiversity. Uh, we have uh, the United Nations Environment Assembly, where there will be a dedicated day talking about food systems. So we get that dialogue within different contexts, whether it's within an environmental context, a nutrition context, a biodiversity context, to ensure that these connections are being made. And also there are independent dialogues. Anybody who wants to host a dialogue and have their ideas feeding into the summit process can do so. And I'll point you to a, a, a website where you can find more detail on, on how you go about that. But let me come back to the member state dialogues. The idea is that in the process towards the summit, we have a series of three dialogues within each United Nations member state um, as we move forward towards the summit. These will be convened by the member state themselves, um, who will appoint a national convener uh, to lead the food system dialogues in an inclusive way. Um, at this stage, we already have 27 national coordinators in place and another 40 countries which are very close to having identified a national coordinator. So already we're up to 60 to 70, which is, is already close to a third of the, the UN member states ready to, to go on this process. Um, the idea of the, the Food System Summit Dialogues at national level is to shape the national pathways, which will incorporate game-changing solutions which are relevant to that nation and, and the communities um, that they serve. And there are essentially four lines of inquiry that will be considered during these dialogues. Firstly, what are the purposes of the current food system and how do they function? What are our expectations for food systems within the next 10 years? What changes do we need to make within the next three years to make that happen? And importantly, how can we, how can we understand how stakeholders can work together better for collective action by forging partnerships, um, for example. Now, this is my, my final slide. Um, none of the components of the Food System Summit work in isolation. So we have a very direct relationship between the work of the action tracks on the one hand and the Food System Summit dialogues on the other. So the action track teams at the moment are identifying potential game-changing solutions. These will be shared with countries as they embark on their food system dialogues to help them frame the dialogue in the context of the Food System Summit. The dialogues will feed back information and feedback on these potential game-changing solutions to the action tracks who will reconsider um, how they shape and begin to operationalize um, those, those game-changing solutions going forward. And then we hope that countries will, will identify clusters of solutions which are particularly relevant to them. And we can work through the action tracks to support countries to start to put them in place as we move towards the summit. So we get this connection between the sort of global level um, discussions about what, what might make sense but also the local reality about what really is needed and what is operational within those countries. Now in this presentation, it's been brief, it's a very complex process, 
Um, but at the same time, um, there are many, many information sources which are available um, if you would like to explore more about the summit and particularly how to engage in this process towards the summit. And so, Mr. Moderator, with that, that final slide, which I, I think will be shared with, with participants, um, I'll hand the floor back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Morrison. I think uh, everyone here are participants uh, looking forward to study and going more deep dive on your presentation since uh, is now uh, somehow we are quite clear how to uh, make a preparation, uh, I mean, for every countries, uh, especially uh, <clears throat> we learned that this uh, next foot uh, system summit uh, will be based on the uh, based on your presentation will be based on the five pillars five action tracks so uh, i think uh, to make uh, a good results of uh, uh, this uh, discussion and all of this iteration process uh, come into the uh, attention for its uh, nationalities and also uh, representative uh, concern um, <clears throat> continuing for this uh, presentation, I'll be inviting uh, Ms. Liz Albrechtsen. Uh, she will be gi giving us and sharing uh, the uh, experience and also uh, the knowledge and also the strategy from uh, based on the country basis from Norway. Uh, Ms. Lisa, uh, I'm, uh, floor is yours, platform is yours. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. I really appreciate to be part of this meeting, this webinar. Um, excellencies, ministry, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Uh, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to present uh, the work that we have done in Norway related to an action plan on sustainable food systems in the context of our foreign and development policies. Important progress has been made on the road to 2030 in several sectors. But as the previous speakers have pointed out, when it comes to food security, we are failing. It is unacceptable that hunger is still on the rise. It is shocking that every fifth child worldwide is stunted. Small scale farmers across the globe are finding, this, finding the struggle to secure a livelihood harder by the day. This cannot go on. With this backdrop, we initiated a discussion in Norway about three years ago. Uh, we realized that we needed to step up our efforts to bend the curve on hunger. This resulted in Norway launching an action plan on sustainable food systems in our foreign and development policies in 2019. Let's see if I can change the slides. Um, there we go. With this plan, Norway will intensify our efforts. Our aim is to play an active and effective role in reducing food insecurity and malnutrition. The overall objective of our plan is to increase food security through sustainable food systems. And that relates to the whole breadth of food security, which means access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food. The action plan takes a whole of government approach. No less than seven government ministers have been involved in the development of this plan. There are good reasons for this, how we produce food, what food we produce, and whether we get enough food are questions of vital importance for our survival and well-being. But these are also important issues for political stability, the resilience of local communities, and the opportunities that individual people have. In other words, food cuts across the full breadth of Norway's foreign and development policies. The action plan takes an integrated approach to increasing food security to I'm sorry, increasing food security through the development of sustainable food systems, and it sets out clear targets and action points. In the work that we have done, we want to break down the silos between the different thematic areas. And this has been also elaborated by the previous speakers. 
Food systems affect and are affected by a, a range of different factors, such as climate change, the environment, infrastructure, and institutions. Food systems also have important socioeconomic impacts on local communities and on society as a whole. areas of our plan uh, in the next few slides. Sustainable uh, climate resilient food production and increased productivity from agriculture, fisheries and aquaculture sectors is what we look at as the main objective of this um, uh, area. Increasing sustainable production and productivity uh, in the food producing sectors are crucial for, for improving food security. And it will also raise the income and reduce poverty for a, range, for a large number of small scale producers. When it comes to value creation and markets, more and more people are settling in towns and cities far away from the areas where farming and fishing take place. This means that food has to be transported often over long distances to the markets. Our aim is to ensure that as much nutritious food as possible is available to as many people as possible and that markets offer people the chance to enjoy a healthy and balanced diet. A sustainable diet is a diet that has low environmental impact. It contributes to food and nutrition security and to a healthy life for generations. A large number of people cannot, food, cannot afford to meet the family need, basic food needs. At the same time, cheap, industrialized, processed, and unhealthy food is becoming widely available. This has led to an unacceptably high prevalence of malnutrition. To combat this, we need improved knowledge, and we need access to healthy and varied diets. Political leadership and good governance are essential for establishing sustainable food systems. Policies related to agriculture, fisheries, trade, private sector, environment and climate, education, and health and nutrition all play a part in developing sustainable food systems. However, coordinating various policy areas within a sustainable framework that also improves food security and nutrition is a challenging task. In closing, Norway is committed to step up our fight against hunger. We will remain a consistent partner to the Rome-based agencies and other relevant actors in our joint efforts to reach the sustainable development goal number two and the other development goals. We also look forward to be an active participant in the upcoming UN Food Systems Summit. And I also want to congratulate uh, Indonesia on soon starting the national dialogues. We have not come that far yet, but we are in process as well. And I look forward to hear more about your work later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Lisa, uh, Ms. Lisa from uh, Norway. And uh, we learned that uh, Norway already uh, providing us uh, the policy setting or the somehow if I'm calling it as a food governance starting in 2019. And I think it's a good uh, example for all of us. Thank you again, uh, Ms. Lisa. And now I'm inviting third speaker, uh, Ms. Carola Ramon from Argentina. Uh, platform is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning to all. First of all, I would like to thank the Deputy Minister of the National Planning Ministry of Indonesia, the UN Resident Coordinator, and the representatives of the Rome-based UN agencies based in Jakarta for organizing this very important webinar. We are definitely at the dawn of a new era and therefore enhancing sustainability of our food systems is crucial. Uh, for that reason, we do appreciate this opportunity to exchange views on how that could be achieved 
especially considering the challenges that have emerged since the outcome of COVID-19. Food systems are currently facing changes that are happening with increasing frequency and speed all over the world. This poses very diverse challenges of varying magnitude, especially in the context of the commitments made under the 2030 agenda, and in particular um, SDG2, which calls us to end hunger, achieve food security, improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture. In an international context in which, according to FAO, food production must increase by 60% by the year 2050 to meet the growing world demand, we must make our best efforts to increase production and agricultural productivity in a sustainable way, in line with the aforementioned agenda. Argentina believes that the UN Food System Summit is a clear example of the growing recognition that food systems are of utmost importance to achieve several of its goals, thus making a huge contribution to accomplishment of the 2030 agenda and its objectives. Of course, not all systems need to undergo a transformative process, as some of them are already sustainable and need only some adjustments. We should also consider that such systemic transformations would require a huge cost, especially for developing countries. And these may lead to lower food production and productivity rates until this newly transformed food system is once work, working again at full speed. What, would, what could temporarily be contrary to the objective of reaching food security for all. We're also convinced that a wide area of solutions are possible and therefore we should definitely avoid a one size fits all solution that may not be suitable for everyone in all contexts. Food security is at the core of the agenda, in particular is closely linked to Sustainable Development Goal 2, as I mentioned on the end of hunger, but also SDG 1, as agriculture is of critical importance to economic and social development and the eradication of poverty. Since a large part of the population, as has been already mentioned, of many developing countries depend on agriculture for subsistence. Food is at the core of all these goals. We all need nutritious and safe food to develop healthy and productive lives. However, according to FAO, over 820 million people are hungry and under nutrition and obesity are also on the rise. Moreover, one third of all food consumed is either lost or wasted. It is also important to highlight that according to FAO, the number of undernourished people will exceed 840 million by 2030. And preliminary projections suggest that this pandemic may add an additional 80 to 130 million people to the ranks of the undernourished in 2020. We cannot turn a blind eye to this situation. This summit and the dialogues that we're going to undertake from now on should guide our efforts and align them in order to achieve these common objectives. From that perspective, Argentina is fully committed with the organization of the summit. We have been actively engaged in the debates undertaken, especially those under Action Track 2, to shift to healthy and sustainable consumption patterns. And we reiterate our full support to the United Nations and the Rome-based agencies in the successful conduct of this event. As mentioned, we firmly believe that sustainable food systems are essential to end hunger and malnutrition, to poverty alleviation and to, to achieve sustainable development for all. From that perspective, we must produce in a way that's economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable to ensure that safe and nutritious food will continue to be produced and delivered to every person in the world. It's beyond doubt that climate change impacts such as droughts and floods are putting more pressure on the resources we depend on and agricultural production by increasing risks associated with disasters and therefore on the achievement of food security. Thus, the agricultural sector needs to be strengthened, including inter increasing international capacities and international cooperation for technology development and transfer, for the improvement of the adaptive capacity of agricultural systems, so that they continue meeting with increasing food demand of a growing world population. Additionally, 
Diets have to be healthy in order to effectively contribute to food security and nutrition. Eating in a balanced way is at the core of a healthy diet, taking into account different proportions, amounts in which each food, food group needs to be consumed. The composition of a healthy, balanced and varied diet depends of the need, on the needs of each person. Fruits, vegetables and meat play a central role in healthy diets due to high nutritional contribution. And these groups of foods provide high quality proteins as well as nutrients and micronutrients, which are of central relevance for human development. Therefore, contributing significantly to food security and nutrition. It is clear that the agricultural sector indeed plays a fundamental role in the economic, social and environmental role in many food production systems, providing income, wealth and employment, and consequently helping to eradicate poverty and hunger. However, it has historically been lagged behind in the process of trade liberalization and is strongly distorted, a situation that has undermined its development possibilities in many countries, especially in those with great potential for the efficient, produ for the efficient production of healthy food. We believe it's time for like-minded countries like Argentina and Indonesia to step up our cooperation, especially in the WTO framework, to try to achieve meaningful results in the agricultural negotiations, bearing in mind that the signals we are all receiving from some developed countries seem to indicate that once again, they're not willing to engage in these yet pending issues that are at the core of the development agenda. Additionally, COVID-19 pandemic has exerted further pressure on food systems, threatening to undermine the progress we've made so far. The stress put on our food systems showed interconnectedness of global challenges and called for a collaborative effort to tackle them. In that regard, we would like to stress the importance of enhancing sustain sustainability of food systems, further liberalize international agricultural trade and strengthening global agricultural value chains. The achievement of these global objectives depends on each of us. We must work collaboratively and individually to make the most of our efforts. Argentina is working to produce healthy food in a sustainable manner, while at the same time reducing food loss and waste. For that reason, we encourage investments and innovation, as those are key tools to achieve sustainable development, promoting growth, job creation, achieving food security and eradicating poverty. The agricultural sector has incorporated and replicated innovative practices, allowing the Argentine agricultural production to increase exponentially in the last 25 years as a result of a process of structural transformation with specialization and the rapid adoption of technologies. We hope the UN Food Systems Summit will provide an opportunity to highlight the importance of investments and innovation in the agricultural sector, as well as to send a clear message on the negative role that agricultural distortive subsidies play in achieving sustainable food systems. Despite the fact that the organization of the summit is taking its first steps, we strongly believe that a clear message should be sent in favor of strengthening the development of sustainable food systems in its three dimensions and emphasizing the need to incorporate the positive aspects of food trade and global value chains in the achievements of healthy diets, food security and sustainable development for all. The time is now to renew our ambition with our shared objectives. What we do now will also support a quicker recovery from COVID-19 as it relates not only to our food systems, but will speed up the process towards achieving the 2030 agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms. Carola Ramon from Argentina uh, <clears throat> on uh, giving us the importance of uh, making uh, more better collaboration uh, and the need of uh, bringing a much better condition uh, for the discussion on the food system and uh, also the experience and the uh, big hope coming out from Argentina. Thank you very much indeed. And um, <clears throat> for the uh, fourth speaker, I'm inviting uh, 
Mr. Drajat Martianto from Indonesia, who will be giving us the uh, experience and uh, study and also the results of the activities within the Indonesia government and also the Indonesia experience and activities. Please, uh, Mr. Drajat. Thank you very much, Pak Anang. Uh, very good afternoon and uh, also good morning to all of you uh, in your respective regions. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity to share the food system analysis in Indonesia. Uh, uh, part of the result, of course, uh, because this is a very comprehensive study, uh, which was a, a joint study between FAO Indonesia and Bapenas and also SIFA Center of uh, APD University. May I share the... <clears throat> Okay, uh, the study was conducted at uh, 2019 actually and uh, finished uh, last year. And uh, what I will discuss uh, and share with all of you here is about the whole food system in Indonesia. And then uh, the current uh, food security profile in Indonesia, uh, policy and implementation gap, which is uh, exists and step uh, towards transformation uh, to establish a resilient food system. And the last will be the importance of the national food agency to strengthen national and sub-national food system in Indonesia. Uh, according to food law number 18, 2011, Indonesia uh, has to uh, develop our own food system uh, at national level and also sub-national level. It is mandated by the uh, food law. And, and according to the food law, that uh, the final no objective, uh, the final goal of the food system supposed to achieve the balanced nutrition, uh, balanced diet, and finally uh, to uh, improve uh, the nutrition, nutritional status of the population. And of course, it also uh, supposed to balance, uh, to develop a balanced economic, social, and environmental welfare. Uh, and according to the food law, again, uh, to achieve that, we need the uh, to preconditional situation, which are food sovereignty, uh, and then uh, food independence or food, uh, actually uh, self-sufficiency. And uh, in this study, we uh, collect, uh, we conduct uh, <clears throat> content analysis of uh, so many uh, regulations, so many uh, laws, so many, uh, including the <clears throat> sub-national and national levels. and. Uh, among the results uh, are presented in this uh, slide. First, uh, <clears throat> uh, we, we define the uh, mapping of the food policy based on the food availability cluster, food accessibility, and food utilization. In the food availability, uh, actually there are so many improvements uh, <laughs> achieved by the government of Indonesia in uh, conducting in achieving the food security although there are still many uh, things to be improved. Uh, the first is uh, that the government policies is likely to focus on the improving of production and availability, more on the emphasis, uh, emphasis on the strategic food. It is uh, reasonable because uh, we need to uh, maintain the price stability and to lower the food inflation rates uh, to maintain the uh, processing power of the most of the community. Uh, but there are uh, the need for vegetables, fruit, and affordable sources of animal protein and local food is important, but not yet a priority in the uh, general policy. Uh, and there, the, among the policy, uh, there are available attention also to uh, the food loss, but it, uh, it is not yet a strategy to increase the food availability. Uh, and then uh, local staple food industrialization is underdeveloped. It is important uh, issue because uh, uh, year by year we increase the importation of uh, even the staple food, uh, uh, wheat flour and also the cassava, even we also still importing that food. And now, uh, uh, of course, also soybean that has uh, become much more important of the Indonesian diet. Um, and uh, we also learned that the food fortification of staple food is exist in the food policy, but um, 
faces uh, so many obstacles in its implementation. Uh, there are delaying uh, implementation of uh, vitamin A uh, fortification in cooking oil, for example. And also, um, <clears throat> rice fortification is started already, but not yet uh, massive. Um, and also, among the uh, obstacles, uh, uh, biofortification actually has already uh, implemented uh, starting last year, but still the, the, <clears throat> the amount is uh, still limited. But I think in the future years, it will become a very important strategy. Uh, and then um, in terms of food accessibility, we still have an agrologistic uh, of, uh, problem in perishable food. Uh, and the strategy is actually uh, scattered. Uh, by commodity, by sector, etc. But logistic is a, uh, we have a very big problem because uh, Indonesia is a very big country with more than 17,000 uh, islands. It's become uh, more complicated. Uh, and also access to food quality limited by poverty and uh, food price. Uh, and then on the food utilization, among the important things is uh, <clears throat> Yeah, strategy to achieve balanced diet is already uh, in place. We have even the national and also subnational action plan, but we do not have uh, the national or subnational food planning as uh, it is mandated by the uh, food law. And then uh, food nutrition education for household uh, is already in place, but has not led to an effective behavior change. Because if we took every if we talk about the diet, of course, uh, behavior is uh, play a very very important role. Uh, and food waste prevention efforts are in place actually uh, in the policy, uh, but uh, <clears throat> it is not yet a massive efforts. Uh, then, uh, if we look at the current food security profile in Indonesia. We have a, a very good achievement in the last uh, decade, actually, of last five years. Uh, before we are in the 73rd uh, rank of, uh, out of uh, 113 countries, but now we are in, in the uh, 62 position. Uh, but the problem is uh, we still have a very big uh, <clears throat> gap in achieving uh, quality of the diet because uh, the quality and uh, food safety is among the main problem. We are in the position of 84 and among the problem of uh, the food quality and safety is because of the lack or, or the <clears throat> inadequate consumption of vegetables and uh, meats, uh, beans, and other protein sources. The protein quality of Indonesian uh, diet is uh, very much low. And also, uh, this will bring the impact of also the inadequacy of the micronutrient intake. Uh, as we look at, as we can see it in this, uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, as we can see in this slide, that uh, we have uh, simple, several issues in uh, several serious issues in food consumption or, or diet of the Indonesian. First, if we look at the uh, quality, uh, the, by average, the quality of the diet of Indonesian, as uh, I mentioned previously, based on the global uh, food security index, mostly are unbalanced. And for the poor, it is even a uh, more serious problem because uh, the problem is not only quantity, uh, not only quality, but also quantity. You can see in this, uh, the latest uh, Susanas on March 2020, that um, among the poor, this is like quintal, first quintal, 20% uh, of the poorest people in Indonesia. Uh, they only achieve uh, more or less 80% of the calorie intake. And uh, you can see, if we look at the <clears throat> uh, commodities consumed, particularly the uh, protein sources, uh, micronutrient sources, from fish, meat, eggs, uh, vegetables, fruits, it's quite a low in comparison to the quintal four or even uh, or five first. So it's a very, very great um, <clears throat> inequality in the uh, food consumption of Indonesian people. 
So uh, that is no wondering that uh, finally we have a triple burden of malnutrition, undernutrition, overnutrition, and micronutrient deficiencies. Undernutrition, uh, we we really have a focus on uh, program on that uh, to to alleviate the undernutrition. Stunting and wasting are decreased, but still uh, considered as the uh, particular problem. Overnutrition, of course, increase. Micronutrient deficiency still uh, exists, uh, and then um, yeah, with the government orientation on the uh, <clears throat> commodities, uh, the strategic commodities, uh, the good thing is uh, we can maintain the low inflation rate. And uh, in terms of balanced diet, we have uh, already uh, mentioned that uh, uh, mostly are unbalanced. Uh, the good thing is that POU, uh, prevalence of undernutrition and NOU is uh, better off, uh, but we still do not uh, know what is the impact of uh, the uh, pandemic on POU and on you, NOU because we do not have the latest data yet. And 95% uh, of the Indonesian uh, approximately approximately 95 of the person of the Indonesian lack of uh, <clears throat> intake of fruit and vegetables that's a big problem because um, and but actually this has also happened in other countries and uh, most of our consumption heavily depend on rice and wheat uh, fortunately our food production and availability is uh, getting better uh, it is exceed the requirement of energy but still uh, supposed to be increased in terms of uh, the diversity. So to uh, based on that uh, situation, uh, we propose uh, based on the, our study, uh, <clears throat> the model of uh, the food system to, uh, and we propose also the reshaping, reshaping strategy. There are eight uh, strategy uh, to build resilient uh, food system in Indonesia. First is integrated, Inclusive in planning, implementation, monitoring, evaluation, and it's supposed to be supported by appropriate budget policy. Sustain and the second is sustainability of food availability. So prioritize on local food. Uh, and of course, it is supported by in industrialization of local foods as main contributor of national and subnational food supply, and also to reserve uh, our uh, uh, <clears throat> diversity of uh, Food available in Indonesia. Food fortification, bio fortification is fortification is also important part of uh, to achieve balanced diet because as you uh, see that uh, the, among the poor, there are uh, lack of uh, protein and also micronutrient consumption uh, sources of food, and of course uh, food fortification and bio fortification should be uh, one one among the strategy. Uh, to improve the balanced diet for the poor, particularly, not only just to improve the quality of uh, the uh, commodity. And then uh, number four is promoting a rebalancing between global and local short uh, or shorter supply chain, combined with improved uh, storage capacity and alternative processing options near area of production. And then number five is reducing food loss and waste as part of main strategy to increase availability and access to nutrition. And six, uh, we have to provide added value of the across uh, through establishment of farmers' corporation in production, distribution and marketing, including loans and tax in incentive. So it is supposed to be a uh, uh, inter-sectoral uh, process. And then the number seven is agricultural production, supply and trading uh, supposed to be into uh, digitalization is very much important uh, and we need a food system dashboard uh, in Indonesia because uh, uh, we have a very uh, large uh, country's areas and divided into uh, so many islands and the, sec the eighth uh, strategy is establishment of national food agency. It is very necessary to harmonize of, of national food planning and sub uh, national food planning. And uh, the good thing is, uh, it is uh, thanks to uh, Bapenas and other sectors that we are already shifting in 2020, we are already shifting the paradigm uh, in food development. This is on uh, the latest uh, RPGM and is the uh, 
national planning, uh, medium term national planning. We are assisting from the old paradigm that uh, it's uh, previously uh, more on the production uh, orientation. Yeah. And the new paradigm is uh, really uh, as, uh, following the food system uh, objective. First is, uh, of course, uh, the food self-sufficiency is more is important for Indonesia and food security, achievement of food security is, of course, important. And then uh, the quality of people, individual diet, including food fortification, biofortification strategy is in place now. It's uh, strengthened in this uh, uh, new strategy. And uh, among the most important thing also is what should be produced uh, should consider the balanced diet. So uh, the production, the uh, <clears throat> effort to procure food, uh, through importation, etc., supposed to consider uh, the achievement of balanced diet of the population. So this is uh, our new strategy. Um, and Babatnas also developed uh, so many priority, which is considered to uh, be able to strengthen our food uh, security through strengthening the food system. Uh, as you can see, there are uh, five activities that uh, become the new strategy in uh, strengthening our uh, <clears throat> food system. First is through the increasing quality of safety fortification and biofortification, uh, which is uh, among the new strategy, and then increasing the availability, price, stability, and sustainability of food supply to maintain supply and of, of course to maintain the price, including aquacultural food, and then increasing productivity and sustainability of uh, sustainability of agricultural human resources, including market access, and then increasing the productivity and sustainability of agricultural natural resources, including agricultural digitalization and then uh, improving national food system and food governance. So this is uh, the new approach. And uh, also um, to face the, uh, to cope with the uh, pandemic and other uh, uh, uncertain situation, uh, the, uh, the government strategy, uh, the government means, also issues the new strategy to face the situation, the abnormality, of uh, the pandemic, for example, or other uh, abnormality or other uh, uncertain situation. Uh, this is, you can see the strategy. Um, <clears throat> so to face the uh, new normal era, uh, the government will take so many efforts to how to uh, shorten the supply chain, for example, through the digitalization, uh, uh, business, uh, food business, agricultural business, etc., uh, and so on and so forth. You, you can see later on uh, because of the limitation of uh, the bank, it will be distributed. And this is also another example at the subnational level where uh, the community, the farmers, and also the local uh, government and uh, other parties, including private sectors uh, and even academia, NGO, and so on. Uh, can working together to join uh, through the digital uh, uh, business. Uh, we can uh, shorten the <clears throat> supply chain uh, to, to make the, to uh, help the farmer get the better prices and also to help the consumer to have uh, uh, cheaper prices. Uh, uh, join together and working together with off taker or even uh, directly uh, the consumer can uh, communicate, can buy from the farmers in uh, lower prices by uh, improving the access to uh, food. And then the last uh, presentation is, uh, we propose the, important, uh, the National Food Agency establishment as mandated by Indonesian food law in Article 1, uh, 126 and 128. We know, we learn that uh, uh, national food agency is very much important because uh, the scope of, of food system development is very broad. And then the food problem is increasingly complex and needs uh, immediate handling. What happened now is uh, very much sectoral. There are so many silos. And then uh, planning, implementation, and evaluation of food system policies 
and programs currently not well coordinated. Before we have uh, what we call as a food security uh, food security council, but it is just terminated uh, last month, and uh, we do not have a coordinating body anymore. And that is the reason that we have to uh, strengthen food system in Indonesia to uh, by establishing national food agencies. And there are three alternatives that we propose in our study. Uh, and among the three, uh, we propose that the third alternative, which are, uh, we can elevate Badan Ketahanan Pangan or uh, PKP or Bulog as national food agency. Uh, but it's supposed to be coordinated by Ministry of uh, National Planning of Papenas. And of course, uh, to operational, uh, in the operational of uh, the food production, uh, food business, food logistics, etc., etc., it's supposed to be supported by um, <clears throat> state-owned enterprises, state-owned enterprises, uh, which are uh, at the cluster of a food cluster as a port operator. Why we we propose the third uh, alternative, and uh, not uh, the first or second alternative, because uh, the first uh, alternative that we just uh, simple as elevate to lock, there are so many uh, complication will be uh, recent. For example, uh, Bulog is no operator of uh, uh, in Indonesia, and uh, it will need so many. Uh, <clears throat> Regulation changes because it is under BUMN, under uh, SOA, <clears throat> and it will need uh, so many changes. And there will be another complicated because uh, Bullock uh, cannot uh, <clears throat> act as a good regulator and also operator. And then uh, the second is uh, we propose uh, Bapanas as the ministry of uh, the, as the coordinator because we know that Bapanas has a strong, very strong. Uh, coordination with Papada at the subnational level. And of course, planning has become uh, easier to uh, be coordinated in also even the uh, implementation and also evaluation. So that is all of our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Drajat Martianto from Indonesia, uh, who is giving us a very comprehensive uh, what Indonesia existing situation and uh, what is the expectation that uh, uh, based on the study uh, work with the FAO and Bapenas. Thank you. And uh, come into this uh, Q and A session. Uh, we do have here 20, uh, 23 uh, questions or response that will be uh, directed into the panelists and also speakers. Uh, but uh, I have uh, the I have been given a prerogative from the organizer that uh, I will be selecting uh, four uh, questions. Uh, and I'll be trying to slowly uh, uh, bringing uh, spelling again for the question. First, I'm uh, <clears throat> the question from Matthew Edward Hermanto to FAO. Papanas and IPP. The question is regarding the land loss, there is another media based farming such as hydroponic, especially for non carbohydrate foods such as vegetables. Do the panelists think that this other media farming can help Indonesia and slash our world? to grow their food and increase our stock on it? I think uh, the question uh, uh, directed to all of the uh, panelists, especially from the FAO, uh, IPB, and um, I'm uh, giving the opportunity for Mr. Morrison from the FAO, 
Thank you, moderator, and thank yes. thank you, Matthew, for that um, that question. I mean, land loss is is one of the clear consequences of the way in which food systems have developed over the the past decades. And within the Food Systems Summit um, process, we have a particular focus under Action Track Three, which is looking to boost nature positive production. So Action Track Three is structured around three. Um, main areas of work. Firstly, protect. So protect land. Um, work to prevent further land loss, for example, through, through reductions in, in deforestation, promotion of commodity, uh, of uh, deforestation free commodities, etc. Um, there's also a, a strand or a working group looking at how we manage the existing uh, resource base in a more sustainable way. For example, looking at options of regener regenerative agriculture. And a third on how we restore um, the existing natural resource base up to its past levels of productivity. Um, through, for example, through the, the decade of ecosystem restoration. So this action track will be considering different initiatives which can help us to move forward in that respect. Now, the example that you provided about um, uh, different media, so considering media other than soils, is, is very relevant because it helps in addressing um, at least the first two of those strands, protect and, and manage. Um, and I think we, we see a lot of examples across the world as to how hydroponics, for example, is being used as a technology um, for, for the production of particularly more perishable um, products which can be grown closer to populations. For ex example, we see the use of the technology um, both in, in urban locations uh, where it can be used in, in various um, approaches to vertical farming, for example, but also increasingly in, in well-developed agricultural sectors where there is pressure on the, the land resource. Uh, in the Netherlands, for example, which is, I think, the, the second largest agricultural exporter, despite its small land base, makes a lot of reliance on, on these types of technologies, hydroponics being, being just one of them. Um, so in answer to the question, yes, there is the potential, but the, the question always comes down to where is the investment going to come, come, to, go, come from? Do we see private sector within... Um, within countries having the ability to access finance to make the investment with confidence that they will have a return on that investment. So that, that's always been one of the sticking points, but I think as these technologies become um, more cost effective, then we will see a greater pickup. It, it's similar, for example, to the, the um, trends we've seen in um, renewable energy sources, which a few decades ago, we all looked at alternative energy sources other than sort of carbon-based energy sources and said well yes but they're too expensive. Now we see them becoming much more cost-effective vis-a-vis um, carbon-based and, and increasingly adopted and I assume this would be the same in, in relation to hydroponics and other um, land saving or soil saving technologies. Thank you. Uh, thank you Mr. Morrison. So for this question uh... It's also possible part of the discussion that will be uh, <clears throat> work into the action track three. Uh, the title for the action track, track three is a boost for nature positive production. So I think uh, for Matthew, uh, this also uh, we are hoping to give a positive response from the FAO. Um, the second question is coming from Marina Bortoletti to FAO again and IPB. Um, the question is, what is the role of urban farming practices for the food systems and diets in Indonesia? Are there data on that? Could this be one of the policy solutions to be promoted by country? I'm giving first for the IPB, but Drajat, you would like to share your uh, 
experience, please, Pak. Okay, thank you, Pak Anan. <clears throat> yeah, of course, the urban farming uh, production is become uh, very important uh, in the near future because uh, we learn from the pandemic, for example, when uh, where uh, uh, when the logistic is a uh, problem, has a problem from the villages, from the uh, far areas of uh, Jakarta, for example. Uh, so there is a, a lack of uh, also taste of uh, the food supply at um, <clears throat> Jakarta and in the market of Jakarta. So uh, the idea, idea is uh, uh, we have to uh, encourage all of the people at the cities, uh, even we know that uh, they have a very small uh, area, that we can uh, develop so many approaches, including uh, verticulture, etc., etc. And then, uh, of course, uh, we have also uh, to encourage uh, the private sector, of course, yeah, to uh, make uh, to to develop the. <clears throat> uh, very smart uh, and uh, high-tech uh, agricultural technology to be developed at the urban area. Uh, and of course, this is uh, for the uh, the uh, high economic level, uh, because as you you see at the, my presentation, that uh, not only the poor people, but even the uh, highest income also have a problem in accessing uh, the vegetables, for example. So it has become a very much uh, <clears throat> uh, potential to, uh, to develop the urban food, uh, urban uh, farming. But we have to also consider the uh, problem of food safety. When we, uh, because uh, there are so many studies in Jakarta, for example, uh, the contamination of because the use of uh, water that uh, the, there are so many contamination, it's become uh, lower the quality and the safety of uh, uh, urban farming. So uh, we propose that uh, when we develop the urban farming, we have to train, we have to, uh, to uh, uh, what do you call it? in Indonesia, we have to, to provide uh, <coughs> the appropriate technology the appropriate approach uh, to not only to produce, but also to maintain the safety uh, of uh, the food produce at the urban areas. That is uh, my question, uh, my answer, Pak Anand. Thank you, Pak uh, Drajat. And uh, I back again for FAO, uh, whether it's also uh, any uh, information or the uh, uh, sharing uh, experience related with the urban agriculture. I'm going back to Pak Morrison, please. Mr. Morrison. Thank you, Pak Anand. Um, yes, I mean, uh, urban food systems um, is an area on which we're placing increasing attention. And, uh, and a key reason for this is that already 70% of the food which is produced globally is consumed within urban areas by, by urban inhabitants. And so clearly the decisions which are made by um, urban inhabitants has um, implications, not just for, for how food is um, distributed and made available within cities. Um, we know that a lot of particularly poorer urban inhabitants often have difficulties accessing uh, high quality nutritional food, um, given the locations in which they're um, living and also the locations in which they're working. Uh, but it also has an implication for uh, producers in peri-urban areas and, and closely located rural areas. Uh, it creates a demand. And so there is significant scope for, for working on food system transformation through urban food systems. Um, at FAO, we have the urban food agenda. We have a framework for the urban food agenda, which helps us to work with municipalities to develop um, their food systems within urban areas in a way which is consistent with the, the broader principles that we've been looking at as to how to move forward the transformation of food systems more broadly within the country. I would just like to, 
to reiterate one of the points that, that Pak Drajat um, made about the importance of food safety in this context. Um, and often we're concerned with the, the um, you know, issues around how we produce more to make more available at a more affordable price. But ultimately at the end of the day, um, food is only food if, if it's safe. Um, if we're consuming food which is unsafe for, for various reasons, whether in the way that it's being produced or the way which it's stored or distributed, then it, it's not food. It's doing us more harm than good. So I think that was a very important point which we haven't touched on um, today, but needs to be reiterated as we develop foods, food um, systems. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Morrison. Uh, it's another two questions. Uh, the third question is from uh, Mr. Mr. Orbis. I'm just calling as Karan Paruta. Uh, the question is directed for Mr. Arifin Rudianto, uh, Ms. Lisa, Lisa, and Ms. Carola. Uh, the question is, can you share the efforts of government in your country to prevent or slow down the reduction of agricultural land. So uh, I, I being, I'm giving the uh, time for uh, Mr. Arifin Rudianto, Pak pa Deputy, Pak Rudy. Or, Uh, I, I don't, I'm hoping he's still available, but uh, uh, while we are waiting for Pak Ru, uh, Mr. Arifin Rudianto, uh, I'm inviting from uh, Norway, Ms. Lisa. Excellent, great. Thank you very okay. much and thank you for that question. Um, first of all, in Norway, only 3% of our land is agricultural land. Uh, hence, the protection of agricultural land is important to us. Um, we are experiencing challenging challenges with fragmentation and the loss of agricultural land. Uh, and our government, especially the Ministry of um, Agriculture and Food, are working very hard to ensure that we do not lose more. Hence, we have um, set up a very rigorous uh, monitoring and measurement uh, scheme looking at the agricultural land and uh, we are working towards very specific goals that we want to achieve and for the last few years we have managed to achieve this goal and unfortunately on top of my head I can't remember <laughs> the specific goal but given that we only have three percent agricultural land in Norway um, I, I, it's not it's not that much land that we have that is actually used for agriculture at the moment so uh, but we are looking into this and we are working very hard to ensure that we protect the land that we do have and use for agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lisa. Uh, Moderator, you are muted. I think you need to talk again. Uh, Anand, Sorry. you are muted. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. you. Are muted, <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the question is coming from Antea Harioko. And uh, Antea Harioko bring the question for all the panelists. Um, with the question is, uh, agriculture reforms are highly political issues that tends to, le to lean towards trade protectionism. Yet sustainable food system solution increasingly rely on greater global integration and trade. Do you think current discourse on agriculture and food is able to view globalization more positively? So I'll be back to the uh, uh, starting from uh, uh, Mr. Morrison and then continuing with uh, other panelists. Please, Mr. Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, yes, no, a, an excellent question. Um, and I think, yeah, we all understand the politics around food within nations. Um, and we've seen that 
to put the duration of the the um, WTO negotiations on the agreement of ag on agriculture under the um, Doha round. Um, I had the pleasure of, of being in, in Bali for the ministerial conference a few years ago where it looked like we would make some headway, but then, um, then yeah, the difficulties are often so difficult to resolve around uh, the national policy space, which is available for countries to support their agriculture sectors and how that conflicts with the, the desires of um, their trading partners. Um, for more open markets within those countries. So I think, yeah, this is a, a continual problem and one we need to recognize when we're talking about food system transformation. Yes, it's a transformation that needs to take place at the national level. It needs to be specific to the national context in line with the objectives of, na of the nation, um, with their cultures, with their, their aspirations, but it also needs to be done in a way which is uh, which recognizes um, the implications for other countries. And so we always need these global frameworks to, to provide um, the space within which countries take actions, um, but which actions which are somehow constrained to ensure that there is not significant damage um, on other countries as a result. Uh, the, you know, the, these issues are, are very complex and, and you know, there isn't, necessarily agreement on, for example, how on, for example, the, the benefits of domestic subsidies. Um, domestic subsidies have very different impacts if they're used within a country where agriculture is still at a relatively low level of development compared to their impact in countries where agriculture is at a high level of development. So, so yeah, the negotiations are underpinned by a very uh, vigorous debate about the relative benefits of different approaches. So I think yeah, th this question gets to, to a number of points, but, but given that, um, I think we've seen particularly within the, the last 12 months or so, the importance of ensuring that we do act as a, as a global community in pushing forward the transformation of food systems. Not just because some of the aspects are truly global in nature, climate change, for example, but also because when we're looking at um, yeah, the livelihoods of, of people involved in the food sector, um, the nutritional status of, of individuals um, within different countries. This is so integrated across the, the, the sort of global economy. Uh, disruptions in one part of the economy can have ramifications in, in others and knock on effects. So we need that, that greater recognition. Um, we need that awareness of the interconnections. And I think as, as Maximo was saying in his presentation, that's where the, some of these trade-offs really come in because they are often cross-border in their nature. They're not confined to the decisions of one, of one nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Morrison. And then I'm inviting uh, from uh, Mr. Lisa from Norway, uh, maybe you can give us the, your perspective on this uh, question or giving a response, please. Absolutely, thank you very much. And it's a, it's a very difficult question. Um, as Jamie said, the politics around food are very intense and they are national, they're regional, they're international. Um, what we are looking at uh, from the Norwegian side is that hopefully the Food System Summit will create a momentum it will open up for dialogues between actors that may not speak so much together on a regular basis. And I think this is going to be very interesting to see in Indonesia as you go forward with the first dialogue on, on the food system, towards the food system summit. Um, the national context is, of course, of relevance, the international context as well. The frameworks that we have are very much important. Um, I, I, um, I'm not I don't have an answer that's going to create or going to give you the full answer, but I'm just going to recognize that it is difficult. It is difficult also here in Norway. But we are also looking forward to in, in start our dialogues and to bring the different actors together. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, re related with the food matters and agriculture is still quite uh, somewhat uh, being sensitive. But uh, we are, yeah. I think I'm uh, uh, inviting as well the experience from Argentina. Uh, Ms. Uh, Carola, please. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'm going to pick up on, on what um, a previous speakers just mentioned. And I think um, if one thing has taught us this last year with the pandemic is the interconnectedness that we all face in the world and how close we are and that these knock-on effects are everywhere. And now more than ever, we have to work together, coordinate it collaboratively and help those most vulnerable. Uh, there's no way that, that we can all come through this situation if we don't work together. And when it comes to, to food security and food issues, I think it's become even more clear in the last year, um, the whole world has worked together in order to make sure that uh, the food supply chain was not uh, broken and that all countries could still produce and make food available everywhere. I think uh, that effort and the effort regarding the vaccines, which is a huge worldwide effort, will guide us uh, through uh, rethinking uh, the, the whole food system. Um, I think in, in this sense that this, this tri tri three issues of healthy diet, food security and sustainability should be able to guide us. And I said, as I said before, we have to make sure that the least developed countries are considered. We have to understand that particularly after this year, the less developed countries are the ones that have been the hardest hit. Uh, and therefore things have to change somehow. We do need to increase collaboration and support with each other. And the more we, we talk together, the more we enhance a dialogue. And this is why this type of webinar and the summit is so important uh, to induce more dialogue and understand the situation that each country faces so that together we can, we can pull along. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carola. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, uh, we do recognize that the experiencing of these uh, quite, uh, quite challenging times in this pandemic is matter for all of the countries, especially giving a shock for this, uh, not only in the village chain and sometimes on the supply chain for the food as well. So um, uh, I, I also trying to uh, uh, get a response from uh, the speakers uh, from uh, from Ibu Krista. Would you like to give a response for the uh, question whether is uh, agriculture and food uh, could be viewed as the uh, part of reviewing or viewing the globalization in a more positive way. Please, uh, if you have a response. You're still unmute. Sorry. If I listen to Maximo Torero uh, in the past uh, 10 months, it was fundamental to keep uh, the goods flowing in order to maintain uh, reasonable prices. I think this is um, a lesson we have all learned uh, in the crisis. Although the purchasing power was affected, the purchasing power of many households was affected and governments uh, struggled to uh, balance this out by social protection. The supply of goods and the prices of uh, food did not rise unreasonably as they did um, in the end of the first uh, decade of the of the 2000s. And this somehow may have helped uh, countries to, to get through at least the first phase of this crisis. So it's, it's fundamental to keep uh, international trade flowing. In Indonesia, it is equally fundamental to keep the trade flowing between 
uh, the different islands, uh, we have a situation where it's almost impossible for people on outer islands uh, to market their products. It's uh, simply uh, very costly. We looked a bit into the orange production, for example, vitamin, vitamin C, and uh, they faced big difficulties in marketing their products now during the crisis. So these are all things that need to be considered in a country uh, that, is, uh, that has the geography of, of Indonesia, mm -hmm. uh, the external uh, exchange of goods as much as the internal. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Krista, for uh, giving your uh, <clears throat> insights. Uh, how quite uh, a sig yes, indeed, significant big challenge for us in Indonesia to make uh, this uh, transformation of the food system in place. So, yeah, we are struggling for that. Hopefully, with the uh, cross fertilization or the ideas through this uh, food system conference, food system session uh, in the next coming September, October, October then we could uh, 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 get the uh, more intact understanding what is the best model for the food system that could be applied for the Indonesia that geographically is highly cost, cost for the uh, connectivity especially. Thank you, Ibu. Uh, and uh, I'm still also uh, be given uh, opportunity for the 10 or 10 minutes for the two questions. Uh, just only one. What is it? Uh, uh, the question is coming from uh, Lala Fadila. Lala Fadila uh, bringing us the question for uh, Pak Richard uh, and Pak Drajat. Uh, the question is uh, how to promote a sustainable food choice to community, especially to those who never know about sustainable concept. In terms of Indonesia, is there a possibility for our government to include healthy and sustainable food promotion movement in line with our food-based dietary guideline? So, Pak Richard. Uh, yeah, thank you. And, uh, thank you. And, a, and a, a really interesting and a really important question. And obviously one that lies very much, <coughs> excuse me, at the heart of the issues that the summit is looking at. I think to give three quick answers, I think there's three things and they've all been highlighted today. One is affordability. We have to ensure that the healthy diets, nutritious diets that people need are affordable. And as Krista highlighted um, uh, in her intervention, you know, more than 30% more than of the population of Indonesia today cannot afford healthy diets if they were available for them to purchase, et cetera. So affordability is absolutely key, far more than I think we often consider. Secondly, and uh, I saw that other question is also asked about this, we know that public information is absolutely key in the same way that we've seen the enormous awareness raising around food loss and waste, which was hardly an issue a few years ago, but we've seen that global, national, local campaigns here in Indonesia, but around the world, have really, really uh, you know, transformed this. And we can see that in many, many countries in the world, the combination of public information around the importance of healthy diets, not just so that you, um, you know, the, it's not just about food and being healthy, it's also about avoiding all of the, uh, the diseases, the non-communicable diseases, diabetes and others, which are so associated with poor health, which healthy diets can address directly so I think the massive importance of, of uh, public information backed up by sound policy and, for example, we've seen in some countries both 
a growing number now in the Arab region where obesity is a massive problem. Also in Latin America, where there's been uh, you know, um, taxes, et cetera, on sweet drinks and the like. So I think this combination of public information and also policies that either encourage or discourage uh, you know, the, the behaviors that we're trying to, uh, to change. And the third point, and it's the point which the deputy minister made very clearly, but also Lisa from Norway, it's the need for these multi-sectoral approaches. There's no need, there's no point in just growing more vegetables or fruit if you don't have the investments in the, in the value chain, you don't have the incentives for producers to shift there, you don't have the health, nutrition policies, et cetera, you don't have, as Krista highlighted, the, um, the social protection policies to enable people to access those healthy foods, even when they are available, et cetera. So those are the three points that I would highlight very quickly. One is affordability. And we know that an enormous amount of work is required to ensure that healthy food is not just available, but also it's accessible, it's, uh, it's, it's affordable. Secondly, it's public information backed up by robust policy. And thirdly, it's the need for multi-sectoral responses and engagements, exactly the type of approaches that lie at the heart, once again, of the summit and the solutions that Jenny was talking about to really ensure that the system is able to produce and give people both make healthy, nutritious diets available in ways that drive economic growth in rural and urban areas, particularly in rural areas, um, don't damage the environment and, uh, and, and the like. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Richard, uh, for uh, giving your perspective and sharing your perspective here. And uh, Pak Drajat, would you like to have your response, Pak, please? Okay, thank you, Anna. <clears throat> I will just uh, give uh, one example uh, that uh, our our strategy to uh, improve the local food consumption and the local food policy is among uh, the way to promote the sustainable food choice to the community. Uh, actually. During, uh, for this, for example, uh, we have uh, around 72, 75 uh, carbohydrate sources of food. And now it's become only five or six that we uh, always consume that. So by uh, <clears throat> promoting the local food uh, uh, production uh, through the industrialization, it will improve uh, the quality and also the acceptability of the, communi uh, the community of the uh, consumer. And uh, I think this is a hidden hidden promotion, I think. Uh, and if we also able to provide a, a new uh, menu, new uh, food product by using the local food, uh, it will <clears throat> uh, direct, directly actually uh, 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 efforts, not only to promote, but also to uh, yeah, directly uh, preserve our uh, sustainable food. Uh, and for example, if we can make a, a clusterization of uh, the cerebral dietary pattern, for example, for Anna, we now have only uh, one GDP. Uh, we know that uh, the people in uh, Papua, for example, 35% uh, of uh, the contribution of carbohydrate is from the tubers. So uh, we have also to uh, change our policy in the GDP, uh, to make a clusterization, the cluster. And I think uh, it is not only promotion, but it, it will uh, be supported by uh, production policy, by uh, distribution policy, by industrial policy, and it will uh, sustainably um, uh, guarantee the food availability of uh, the local food, and it will promote uh, the consumption of the local food of the Papua, for example. And then finally, uh, of course, uh, there is a possibility for our government to include the healthy and sustainable food promotion movement in line with our food-based dietary guideline. Because as you see at the uh, food pyramid, for example, there are so many uh, local food uh, that uh, if it is consumed, it is healthy. For example, uh, as I mentioned before, there are so many tubers that is very much uh, important in our consumption because uh, we consume uh, a very high uh, amount of rice. You know that uh, to produce uh, one kg of rice, we need uh, more than 100,000 liters of water uh, to consume. Um, so uh, it is not uh, healthy for the, the environment, actually. So we have to reduce uh, 
according to the desirable dietary pattern, PPH, we actually for the Indonesian, it's only need around 80 to 85 pages per year, but now we consume around 100. So if we can promote the other uh, carbohydrate sources, for example, uh, we can uh, not only make the people healthier because uh, uh, Cassava, etc., is a, a, has a lower glycemic index, for example. And at the same time, we promote the sustainable uh, food production and uh, consumption. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Drajat. Uh, before uh, I'm ending this session, I would like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Maximo uh, because I think it is a uh, pretty much close with the concept of the agri-food system uh, and the first of uh, uh, speak uh, presentation and uh, the response is uh, quite a bit uh, I think it's also very popular but sometimes people is in the local level difficult to understand what is the sustainable concept that could be uh, implemented especially uh, to get the sustainable food choice to the community. Uh, please, Mr. Maximo. No, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and essentially, I think uh, the point is for sure, as it was mentioned, that we need to increase access to healthy diets. Uh, and there is a definition of what a healthy diet is, which includes the concept of diversity. Uh, but the, the problem today is that uh, the access, the cost of accessing them is, is unaffordable to a significant amount of the population, the world 3 billion people. And how to change that? That's the question. And here is where we need to combine efforts both on the supply side, but also on the demand side. And I think as it has been said, on the demand side is a behavioral issue. We need to change the way people behave towards more nutritious food, because that will increase also the demand of it and therefore access to it. It requires also more information to consumers. Uh, sometimes we miss that and, and we don't provide the detailed information. And there is some experiences uh, like the labeling system, for example, in Chile, which has been pretty successful from where we can learn, uh, which is better to the lighting system. For example, we have shown to be more effective than the simple lighting system. Uh, but on the producer side, uh, here is where we need to understand that uh, what we have observed in COVID-19 is, is important because it has shown us one more time of the importance of food to be able to move across borders and within countries across parts of the country. And Indonesia, as you said, is complex in the sense of transportation and how to cover all the islands. So, so again, is we need to look at the logistical side. We need to assure that the logistical side can operate properly to distribute the food. Because if not, when we are talking of more perishable food, it will be problematic. We will increase food losses and waste. So, so we need to be very careful on the logistical side. That's a lesson learned from COVID-19. But we also need to assure that trade works. It doesn't make sense to think that as a result of COVID-19, we need to move into self, self-sufficiency. Uh, we, we understand that that's impossible. Uh, there are countries that don't even have rivers, like Cape Verde, for example. How those countries that don't have rivers can grow food to satisfy the demand? Mobility of food is needed, and, and that's what we need to assure in an efficient way in, in proper mobility of goods. And, and that's where we need to facilitate and improve trade and find which are the constraints and how we can remove them. And here, what we learn also is the role of intra-regional trade. We focus too much on global, but there is huge opportunities of intra-regional trade. And that's something that I think Indonesia can explore. And also on the production, and that's where innovation can come, the accelerators I was referring to. I think uh, in most of our countries, we have a still a significant potential to grow and to improve and to be more effective in the way we use our natural resources. And that's where digital technologies can play a role, but also knowing and bringing all the scientific evidence on what every technology can tell me. And we don't need to focus on one, we can focus on a package of a menu of technologies to resolve the bottlenecks we have. So again, supply and demand has to be taken together in a system approach, understand the trade-offs, and also the synergy. Sometimes doing things at the same time helps a lot and create positive things. But we need to understand those so that you can choose the correct path to achieve SDG2. But thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Maximo. I think this is really great, uh, strong point coming out from you, how to bring this uh, transformation of the food system happen. 
And uh, for this session, again, thank you very much for all the panelists. Uh, I was uh, really giving a highly appreciation of all the insights, response, and uh, the comments. And of course, uh, also for uh, the participants, we do have uh, quite significant participants for this session. And uh, again, thank you very much for the collaboration between FAO, uh, R, uh, IFAD, and also the WFP, RBA syndrome, and also a, a representative from other governments from Norway and Argentina and Indonesia as well. And uh, thank you very much for, the, uh, for having uh, the session and also for the organizer for the Jakarta Post. And I'm giving back uh, the session to the operators. Please, uh, three. Thank you very much, Pak Anang, for carrying out the the webinar sessions really fruitfully in a fruitful discussions we have today. Um, but before we officially close this webinar, I will invite Mr. Ivan Kosia Cortez from IFAD to deliver a five minute closing remark. Uh, I hope Mr. Ivan is here. Mr. Ivan, the platform is yours. Is Mr. Ivan here? I am here. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, uh, uh, Paganang, uh, very good Pag morning. Vice, Vice Minister. Nice to see you, Paganang. Nice. Uh, and I would like, first of all, to thank uh, Bapenas for uh, all the efforts done to uh, set up this event. I would like to thank and to everybody who participated and attended because I personally had the opportunity to uh, learn and to reflect based on what all you said now, and that helps all of us to continue discussing and reflecting on a structural challenge we have on our hands, that is to transform food systems for affordable and healthy diets, as the name of this webinar uh, says. I would like to also thank so much uh, the FAO colleagues, particularly our colleague and friend Dick Trenchard, FAO representative who managed to transform a FAO Bapenas event into a RBA, RBA's Bapenas event. And this is not uh, a small thing. And also to greet my dear colleague and friend, Krista uh, Rader, WFP representative. Uh, thank you all of you. Sorry for this long introduction, but I consider it necessary. I would like to mention quickly four or five uh, key points as closing remarks, if you allow me. Transforming food systems, as PAC Vice Minister said, implies to see the whole picture instead of only silos or partial uh, portions of, 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 the, of the full picture. It means looking at production, at trading, and at consumption of healthy and nutritious food. This is a starting point that is essential and is not necessarily obvious. I would like to take, following this reasoning, what uh, Krista Rader, WFP representative, said, that this implies shifting from a sectoral approach to a holistic approach. This is also fundamental. And conceptually is easy to understand, but in practical terms is very challenging. It's very challenging not only for the governments, but also for the UN agencies. And this is why the RBAs are working together more and more in Indonesia, exactly to try to get a common understanding in a common view on how to contribute to, trans to the transformation of the food systems in a sustainable manner. In the case of the government, and I'm not talking only about Indonesia, it's also a big challenge because by default, by definition, governments are organized in sectoral terms where agriculture, health, nutrition are in different ministries which not necessarily talk each other. So I uh, allow me to say that from our perspective, from the RBA's perspective, 
the role of BAPENAS in uh, encouraging and promoting this cross-sectoral dialogue is essential. Because you, Pa Vice Minister and Pa Anand, have the mandate to exactly think the full picture. And this is what we need in order to transform, to contribute to the transformation of food systems. Maximo Torero brought a point that I will take advantage of. He brought several important things, but I want to highlight one of them. He underlined that we need to produce more while at the same time we need to reduce the pressure we are making on natural resources in, on the environment, for obvious reasons. Otherwise, we are killing the planet. And that's what we are doing very successfully, unfortunately. This means, from my perspective, that building sustainable food systems that allow the world population to access healthy and nutritious food is not possible to be achieved if we don't ensure a sustainable management of natural resources. And this balance is essential. Otherwise, we can have some achievements in the short term, but in the long term, we are, we are, we are going to fail. Uh, and I would add that it's not possible to do if we don't strengthen small farmers' resilience to climate change. Because we have to keep in mind that at least 80% of the food globally produced is produced by uh, family farmers. Most of them small farmers, and a very important portion of them poor farmers. So, if they are not resilient, we are not going to achieve a sustainable transformation of food systems that allows the world to feed itself in a sustainable and healthy manner. But there are also other challenges that were mentioned, and some of them I want to put quickly on the table. Social inclusion, we cannot, we are not going to achieve sustainable food systems transformation without social inclusion, without gender equity. And I would add, without finding a balance between making food affordable, while at the same time, we ensure that agriculture is a profitable business. Affordability and profitability have to go together. Otherwise, what is going to continue happening is that more and more small producers mainly leave agricultural production. And if there is no production, there's no food consumption. Therefore, nothing is going to happen, really. Other element that is very important in this regard is, and, and that was also mentioned, is how to find a balance between local production and consumption and national, international, and global trade. This is very important and even more important now that we are facing for almost one year so far, all the restrictions emerging from the COVID crisis we are living. Where the terms of trade changed dramatically, showing us that we need to rely more on the local without closing our eyes and without closing the borders to the international trade. All this happens in the framework of a big and unbelievable paradox. We know that globally we produce more food than we need to satisfy the world population needs. I won't I'm not going to deepen on this discussion, but something has to happen also there. It was very important to listen to the colleagues from Norway, Argentina, and Indonesia, to share with the, all the participants their different perspectives in terms of visions, policies, and actions. Uh, and I would like to thank the three colleagues from these three countries for bringing us a sense of realism and for bringing us particularly uh, Pagdrajat. Uh, the discussion that in Indonesia is happening in terms of the policy discussion that could lead to changes in the institutional setup 
in order to better achieve the rural and the food systems transformations we are talking about. I would like to finish saying that, in my opinion, and Dick and Chris allow me to talk on behalf of the three, of the three RBAs, the Food Systems Summit is and will be a very important milestone. But the journey towards the summit is as important as the summit itself. And the dialogues like this, and all the platforms and forums and national dialogues that can be set up and that can take place in the following months will be essential in order to increase the awareness that the societies, the institutions uh, have in terms of the importance of, of, of sustainable food uh, systems. This journey and these dialogues are going to be essential in order to engage national stakeholders, local stakeholders from different sectors, public, private, NGOs, small farmers, uh, producers, etc., etc., And in order to build agreements and to make commitments for action, for concrete action that will allow all of us to concretize action towards sustainable food systems as part of the SDGs uh, commitments that worldwide we assume. Uh, maybe I, oh my God, I spoke 10 minutes in, instead of five. I'm really sorry for that. Uh, thanks again for this opportunity. And uh, it was great to be with you and to uh, learn from all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ivan. That was a very wonderful closing remarks from Mr. Ivan. And, and thank you. Thank you very much for all speakers and uh, participants for the delightful discussion today in the Jack Post 26 webinar. I apologize that if, you know, we might fail to deliver all of your questions to the panelists given the limited time we had. And I would like to invite um, all the speakers um, and all the panelists to uh, turn on your camera and then face your camera and then smile because we're going to take a picture and I'll count to three. One, two, three. All right, thank you very much. Um, Stay tuned to our website, thejakartapost.com and our social media for more webinar episodes and for um, other updates on, on news and other uh, the Jakarta Post series uh, webinar. And thanks again. Uh, see you again on the next webinar. Stay healthy, stay well, and goodbye. Hi. Thank you, Pak Ivan, Pak Richard, Pupista, Thank you. Thank you, Panang, and everybody. Right. Thanks yeah, thank to you. everyone. Take care. Makasih, Pak Drajat, ya. Terima kasih, Panang. Excellent. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Terima kasih, Pak Ivan. Bye, everybody. Bye again. Bye. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Big pleasure. Thank you so much. Anna, Michael, thank you. Bu Krista. Yeah. Thank you. Pak Dick as well. Thank you. Anna, thank you. Michael. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.